Hey everyone, this is Tommy Black and welcome to Five or More Questions, episode number 31. On this show, I talk with artists about their current projects, stories they've never told before, and their connection to the Viper Room on the Sunset Strip. Today we're talking to Bruce Whitkin. He's a musician and a producer who's worked with many artists, including the Hollywood Vampires, Adam Ant, and Marilyn Manson, just to name a few. So let's give him a call. Hello. Bruce Whitkin. How's it going, man? How you doing? I'm good. You hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Yeah, yeah, we're walking around where my wife grew up, down South Miami Beach. Oh, that's South Beach. That's cool. <laughs> that's so cool. It's so not like what we remembered it. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed. All right. Oh, yeah. Big time. You're from Florida, right? You're from Miami? or I'm, I was born in New York, and then, as Jews do, we migrate. Our parents migrate to, uh, <laughs> to Miami. So I think when I was like, 10 we moved down to florida and i was here until 84 is when i finally moved to la wow cool and in florida um your band was the kids in florida it started in florida right? yeah that's yeah that's sort of where it's pretty much where i cut my teeth down here my mom used to like she was a booking agent down here uh-huh um she wasn't in New York. She just, you know, single mom, did whatever job she could. But when she got down here, she came down with some friends that were musicians that I'm still friends with, guys that I've known my whole life. Uh -huh. And um, so she started an agency booking clubs around here. And so when I was like 11 or 12, all I was doing was hanging around with musicians. And they, uh, they started to get a good following and playing clubs and so it kind of... What sort of scene was your mom booking around down there? Well, it was interesting. Back back in the early 70s, obviously, it was hard to play rock and roll because disco was what people wanted to hear. <laughs> but the band that she managed was a rock and roll band, and so they they did the disco thing for like six months, and then they just started playing rock and roll. They just said, screw it, and started playing rock and roll and doing their own music, writing their own music. They were a band called Tight Sweets, hmm. and they were pretty popular down here in the mid '70s, up until probably '78 or '79, and they broke up, and that's when the kids started. Hmm. So you know, I mean, I, I started the kids a little bit before that, um, before they broke up, but um, so yeah, so that's what she was doing. She was booking bands, and then she managed that band, and that's at one point they had a club down here in hollywood called the tight squeeze club it was the name of the band they met up with this promoter guy or this club owner guy who said look you guys play here on the weekend well, i'll give you the door and but then they went into business with each other so the band sort of had its own club and then they would let the original bands come in and play because nobody was really allowing original music wow so that was the whole thing. That's the, the beginning of a, a small scene that started right before that band kind of broke up, which was a drag. But that's kind of where the scene took off for me and the kids. Because we would be, we played covers because that's why we wanted to make a living, but we would do mostly originals. So if we would do covers, we were, really weren't doing what was on the radio. We weren't playing Journey or Foreigner. We were like playing Dave Clark Five or... Mm. You know, sort of the clash stuff that wasn't on the radio yet. It was like, you know, sort of underground. Because cool in Florida, in Florida, it was nothing like New York or L.A. I mean, it was it was sort of it was behind the times. You know. Yeah. I mean, they didn't know about the Sex Pistols till four years after they broke up. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I would go to New York, you know, and and find new music and bring it back and. When MTV started, it changed a little bit. Yeah. But the club scene down here was either playing all covers or if you're lucky, you could split it up. And so the band, the kids, because we were a bit different than everybody else, we used to get really good opening slots. Like we opened up for the Pretenders and B-52s wow. and 
you know, a bunch of bands that would come into town because we were the only band that kind of fit with that stuff because everybody else was either into, like, you know, rock, you know, Molly Hatchet, or there was a punk scene that was going on, but it was still brand new. So, um, you know, there was very, it was sort of like a lost time, I think. The industry never came down here. No. They thought it was just, you know, they thought it was just a retirement home. But there was a good vibe down here from mid, mid-70s mid till probably the 90s. And then, I guess, you know, Manson's from down here and mm-hmm. a few other bands. But when I was down here, we had to get out. That's why we went to L.A. Hmm. You were in um, Florida and you decided to move to L.A. around when? It was 80s and basically... 84, beginning 84. It was the end of 83. We spent Christmas here of 83. Mm-hmm. So, and we, we, we lasted about just about a year. One of the guitar players who's a dear friend now, still, and I see he lives out here now. He just couldn't, didn't, couldn't take it out here. It was hard in the beginning. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was with my, who would to be my wife for 30 years. I was already with her. Wow. Not knowing it, but I had that support system. And yeah. At one point, the guitar player wanted to go home for a bit, so he went home, and then he didn't come back for a bunch of years. But it was okay. It, I mean, Johnny started to do some auditions, and I just kept playing, doing music however I could. And uh, and yeah, so I've been in L.A. since '84, mm. and I thought it was like. You know, the band kind of stopped playing, and I had some songs. I wound up getting a couple of songs and some movies really early on when we moved out. Very cool. In, 80, in 85, I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. You know, I hook up with this. I won't mention the guy's name because he's a huge name now, but this kind of music supervisor. Mm-hmm. And um, I had some songs I had recorded, one that I did in my bedroom and one from an old demo tape. And I like I sold them these two songs, and they were paying big money back then. It was like twenty grand a song. Yeah, back then yeah. it was different. Yeah, but the deal was is he wanted a kickback. So if I got forty grand, he wound up with twenty of it. Mm-hmm. But I didn't care. I'm figuring, hey, I got a relationship with the guy. I did a couple movies, and then he just got bigger than I would. You know, then I never heard from the guy again. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. But I was like, man, this is great. I bought my first like real recording setup. I wasn't recording on little cassettes anymore. And, and yeah, I always had an affinity to record. I always loved that uh-huh. part of it. You Did know? you record the kids' stuff too? Did you produce that early on, or? Well, I, the first few recordings we did down here, we got to do with a, a, a guy by the name of Steve Klein, who was working out at Criteria, which was. Like where um, Hotel California was recorded, wow. Layla. I wow. think it was Layla, yeah, it was recorded there. And and he was like the house engineer, and he took, you know, took a liking to us. And But we didn't really know who we were yet, you know. And yeah. nothing against him at the time, but his vision of who we were wasn't really what we thought we were. You know, you, know, you just have those moments when you're like, okay, I trust this guy. And we were all in our either late teens or early 20s. And it just never really sounded like we did live. And the best recording we ever did is we were out here rehearsing and there was a mixer at some rehearsal studio we were at where Oingo Boingo happened to be rehearsing. Hmm. And so I set up this mixer with a cassette deck and I and we made like a live demo there that a friend of mine shopped around for a while. But I remember the day we got here, I turned on MTV and like Quiet Riot's the biggest thing. It's like, come on, come on, feel the noise is the number one video on MTV. And I just knew we were late because we were just not that kind of band. Yeah. You know, we were more like, you know, The Clash meets The Alarm meets something like that. You know, we weren't New Wave, but we weren't metal with, you know, Floyd Rose guitars. We right, just sort right. of like a. I just had this sick feeling. Oh, I think we're a little bit late, and but I still don't regret the move. I, no, not at all. You were on your own tip, and it was a cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a cool now, tip. At the, to best, be at. At, the, yeah, at the best, we might have been on MC, uh, behind the music at one point. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out for John. It worked out for Johnny, and I'm glad it did. You know, to a point. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Uh, but um, 
No, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, and then so after that, I just started playing around town with people, meeting people, mm -hmm. you know, doing different things. Then I did a tour with Adam Ant. What was that? In the 90s. What was that like? What, what happened is I had one, of, you know, I kept going even after the kids left. I'd put a band together, get some manager, do some, you know, demos for this uh, guy or that guy. And I had this band going, and he had come and seen us play, and he asked me if we could um, be his backup band and play the K-Rock Christmas show for him. Wow, yeah, the K-Rock Acoustic Christmas or whatever it is. Exactly. Yeah. I think it was either 92, I forget what it was. And I'm like, yeah, sure, we'd be happy to huge, do it. Huge, huge show. <laughs> yeah, and he was, I mean, it was the first time I felt like, wow, you know, this crowd loves this guy. Yeah. You know, we did like a quick four or five songs, and and then after that, he asked me to go out and play bass with him. On, he asked me to do a tour, and then I did did his record that was called Wonderful. Very cool. And I if I if I if there's cool rhythmic yeah. stuff going on there, quite a bit. Oh, Adam, the early <laughs> Adam stuff. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's weird. It's like in all honesty, it was a part of me when I was younger. I didn't totally dig it and get it. Yeah. It's probably because. Probably because Lori liked it, and Johnny, everybody liked it, so I'm like, I'm not gonna like this. I like Elvis Costello, Joe Jackson, yeah. book this. But then when I went to play f with him, and we're at rehearsal in London, and I'm the only American there, and everybody's sitting around. I'm like, what are we doing? And they're like, well, well, Adam, you know, is not going to be here for a week. I'm like, so what are we going to do? Just sit around? I said, let's fucking rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> so I picked and I picked up the album. It had the lyrics in the, in the sleeve. This goes that shows how far back i'm talking <laughs> there were cds but they had albums there yeah and then i started to like really read the lyrics and understand where he was coming from and i became like a new fan yeah of, it happens of what he was about you know that happens sometimes you're like eh, and then you learn it and you're like wow this is really good. yeah and he was <laughs> such and the professionalism and the artistry behind that man you know, it's odd because like, my daughter's out there opening up for him right now. Oh, she's see her tomorrow. Yeah, they're out there on the road. Glam so, Skanks. Okay, let's. Yeah, so I was going to bring up your daughter V and, is in the Glam Skanks. Yeah. Who plays the Viper yeah. a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. Jessica. And that's why I'm. Yeah. That's why I'm down in Miami. Yeah. Oh, cool. And they're touring with Adam and. That's with Adam, yeah, they're supporting him. Yeah. Very cool. Are they having fun? It was interesting because. Uh, oh yeah, they're having a blast. You know, I um I met. His, you know, I've always known Adam, but I never thought about asking him, you know, to take them out. Mm -hmm. But we, I actually hired this publicist that knew him hmm. and said he was going out on tour. I said, well, I would never ask him, but if you want to tell him it's my kid's band and send him the music, and if he's into it, that'd be great. So um, she sent him, you know, what we had done at the time it was a couple years back, and he liked it. And this is probably what will be probably the hundredth. 120th show I think they've done with him Jeez. over the, since 2016. He's played with two, crowd, two generations you know, of Witkins. <laughs> exactly, it's funny. It's funny. His crowd, what? Um, His crowd likes him. Yeah, yeah, he likes them, and they, you know they, they're professional. They don't fuck around. They just do their job, yeah. and he likes that because I'm sure he's been through crazy opener slots. You know, people not showing up. To, mm. um, but back to what I was going to say before, another thing about Adam is he was just so, the artistic side to him about the way the show looked and what the banners were going to be like and the backdrop and the t-shirts and, mm. you know, it made me understand, you know, about that guy because he deserved what he got, you know, when he made what happened for him and I'll always respect him for that, you know. Mm. He had a, he had a plan. <laughs> yeah, he had a vision, and you know, it was a hard. You know, I think it was post punk. You know, he had two drummers, and completely original. Oh yeah, very original. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I was looking up you up as as I do. By the way, for for civilians who don't know, the kids you were in a band with Johnny Depp. The kids you guys right. moved out here together from right. Flo Florida, right? You guys all did yeah, you, did, yeah, in eighty four. Yeah. yeah, this is me. And, it was me, him, and. Joe Malone was on guitar and Bill Hanty was on drums. That was the four of us. Okay, I'm just giving the you word, yeah. so yeah. people that don't know know, and yeah. that must have been cool, you know, in the beginning. Okay, um, got that out there. 
Um, yeah. I saw you <laughs> also uh, did some stuff. I'm I'm just going through this because I saw it. Uh, Drive Blind. You you produced Drive Blind. What happened was that I was good friends with this uh, a guy who was running um, Interscope, mm -hmm. running a part of Interscope, and they had were doing a record with some producer at the time, and they asked me to do one song because they they were either I forget the the details behind it, but I got to do one song with them, which was great. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the you know the uh, the name to produce it the whole record but they gave me a shot at a song which was oh, really good and they cool. liked it they were good guys it was a cool band and i wish yeah. something really would have happened they for them they used to always play that i remember they played a lot at the club and they were going to be the thing i don't know what oh, yeah man. i they think were it was, it was, they were either english or one of the guys was scottish i forget scottish but, i think but yeah yeah, I, I, yeah so, I brought them into my little studio over in west hollywood at the time good and, band yeah, good yeah, man. Good guys. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going through this. And Marilyn Manson, you did some stuff. Did you do a Marilyn Manson song or something? Yeah, I was um, I was hanging out at Johnny's house one night, and um, Manson was over there because those guys are friends for a long time. And Marilyn was talking. Goes, I want to do a cover of <laughs> "You're So Vain" by Carly Simon. He looks at me, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I went and figured out what key it would be in, and I just started like slowly building the demo track and he's like that's cool and we worked on it they're all done over at johnny's old little place wow. and the way it was built up it was really cool it's like you know we did use some drum machines in the beginning and um and then we brought a drummer in but there was something that we're almost done with the thing and there was something missing to me and i'm like Manson, you have to play guitar on this. He goes, I don't play fucking guitar. I said, Yeah, I don't care. But you, you play. You, you're the. You have this, that hand, that sound. He goes, Really? And I'm like, Yeah. Uh, so, so I said, You know, he. I had to actually point to him because he, like, he liked it open, two open, D, the whole thing. Like, mm -hmm. and once I got his guitar in there, it sounded right to me. But uh, until then, no matter how heavy the guitars we put on, it didn't sound right until I had it. At Manson on there, and it was fun. It was just something we did for fun, and then it wound up on his record. So that's cool. And for you as a producer to recognize that a different take on the guitar would make yeah, it. Yeah, I just knew there was something missing, and I don't know. I didn't even ask him if he on his other stuff if he ever played or anything. But you know, I mean, he's another guy who, when he knows what he wants and his focus and his artistry, you know, he was on top of his game. He, couldn't touch them and that's a lot of i think sometimes stuff. yeah I, th I think sometimes people don't realize that they just think some guys get in a room and rock out mm -hmm. when it's more than that it's like an whole idea and a, a focus and you you know you do it because you love it and you do it because you want it to be the best it can be i remember i was got to work with andy johns the legendary andy johns mm -hmm. did you know stairway to heaven did Black Dog. He was in, he's Glenn John's brother. Glenn's legendary right. too. Right. But I got to work with Andy a little bit in my small place because he was, first time I met him, he was going to do a record with LA Guns. And uh, they called me and because I knew some of those guys. And they said, hey, man, we're going to have Andy Johns do drums for us and then you'll finish it. I'm like, cool. I said, but Andy Johns? Like, the <laughs> Andy Johns? And they're like, yeah. I said, well, I need to call this guy because one, I've never met him, and I mean, I had a Pro Tools studio. You know, I had good mic trees, but I was still recording into a computer. And so I called Andy, and I'm like, hi, Andy. He goes, hello. And I'm like, he goes, um, I go, Andy, this is Bruce. You're going to be recording at my studio. I go, oh, yeah. I go, I, so I just want you to be aware. It's, you know, I have a bunch of cool mic trees, but it's we're recording on, in Pro Tools. And he's like, what, with a fucking mouse? You know? <laughs> but we me and him just hit it off and i mean i grew to really love the guy unfortunately we lost him a few years back and uh, i learned a lot from him in the sense of he i mean he was he just had this thing about him and obviously he was never one of the kind of engineers or producers that said like what do you think he's been asked every time every time somebody saw him? How'd you get the drum sound on when the levee breaks? Yeah. You know, yeah. everybody would ask him. And 
he wouldn't get into this whole technical thing. He goes, we put some mics up in the hallway and Bonzo hit the drums, you know? Right. He wasn't that guy that would take a bunch of credit. Oh, we we'll use a, you know, a U-47 in the kick drum. You know, he yeah. was like, he really understood that if he was, it was the artist that you're working with and you got to do your best to get out of them what they want as quick as possible before they get bored, you know? Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. um, that's cool. Yeah. Andy was a, I miss him. He was a, you know, miss him. He's that's, a good guy. That's cool. And people like that, they just get the job done. They don't mess around. They just do it. Even if he, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, for sure. I mean, I look, obviously people know he had his issues with drinking and it's well known, but, you know, when he was cutting his teeth, those guys weren't getting points or nothing. They would just get paid a flat fee. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the guy was on 60 million records, and, you know, and a lot of them he wasn't getting points or paid on. Mm. And it was just a different era, you know, a different. And, you know, Jimmy Page wasn't going to give up anything to anybody, you know. <laughs> but still, he did great work after Zeppelin. He did some great stuff with Van Halen and things like that but it was hard because sometimes i could tell he wasn't happy working on what he was working on but he just took the gig because he needed the gig you know mm -hmm. just working in my little studio teaching him how to work it on a mouse you know? wow it's, wow it's a trip that yeah. is a trip um you did chucky weiss red beans and weiss <laughs> well, oh yeah. well chucky i mean i've known chucky since the central right you know back in the day now chucky talked uh uh the rumors chucky talked johnny or got johnny to buy the viper and start the club there right is that correct that's or? what the yeah i believe that was the rumor yeah i mean i was around at the time and i heard johnny bought the place and i, I was excited for him i remember going in the in the central crawling in the ceilings taking the snakes out and yeah. redoing the pa when we first when he first opened the place in 94 hmm 93, 94, yeah, and uh, Johnny loved the place. I mean, he took pride in it. It's it was uh, it was interesting because he 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 wanted to just have a cool place to hang, and Chucky would play there. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Chucky is just a very interesting talent, man, and he's always been that guy, and he's a sweetheart. You know, yeah, we did that. We did that at Johnny's place too. Oh wow, little, cool. Yeah. record that Chucky just did yeah yeah he was always he's always sweet he's always been a really cool guy yeah I mean when I remember that when I moved out here in 83 it's like you gotta go to Monday night and see Chucky I mean no you haven't seen Chucky yet I'm like okay back then after the band I the kids broke up I had a band called the Lonely Bulls and we used to play with Chucky all the time we were sort of like the Everly Brothers with a loud drummer that's what we were like and wow Couple, I remember we played two New Year's with uh, Chucky once at the Vi at the Central. Central. Before it turned over to the Viper. Yeah, I, I think like eighty eight and eighty nine. Yeah, I moved yeah. here in eighty nine. I barely remember the Central. It's a foggy memory, yeah. but I went there a couple of times. It was pretty much yeah. the same setup as it is now. Pretty right? much, you yeah. didn't really do much. Yeah, you couldn't yeah. change it that much. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But the early days on, did you? Uh, do you have any uh, memories or stories of, of those early days? Any other ones? Any tidbits? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, the, the Central was always a place that you could go play, but then when it became the Viper Room, you know, through all the uh, time that I put a band together and find some manager, I mean, I was always knew that I had a home there to play, and it yeah. was, you know, one, obviously, because I knew Johnny and Sal were running the place, but Everybody just, I, they were just so cool to us that, you know, we would get to play on a good night. And I would always just say, let my friends in for free because parking's expensive. We don't care to make money. We just want to have fun, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of my favorite gigs were done there. When we were on the Adam Ant tour, the first one I did, we wound up doing a, an unannounced show at the Viper Room. That's cool. With Adam Ant, I remember. It was probably in 95 or something. Mm -hmm. Um but, oh, yeah, so many memories there. I remember opening night of the Viper Room was Tom Petty. Uh-huh. You were there? Yep. You were there? Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, because, yeah, I mean, I helped them put the first PA in there. I wasn't going to be a sound man. It wasn't my shtick. But Johnny's like, what do we buy? What should we get? And so we wound up shopping. And um, 
you know, wiring everything up. I remember testing the PA early on. It's a good sounding yeah. room to begin with. It's you know? always a great sounding room. Always was. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, I got a lot of fond memories. I remember I would get, I would get these calls from Johnny like at one in the morning. Hey man, what are you doing? Like the phone would ring and she'd look at me. She goes, gotta be Johnny. I'm like, what's up? He goes, um, I can't remember his name at the moment. Singer from NXS. What was his name? Michael Hutchins. Yeah, God rest his soul. Yeah. Johnny calls. He goes, Michael's here. It was, it was somebody's birthday. He goes, you want to come down and jam? I'm like, I'll be wow. there. Give me 10 minutes. Wow. So I go down there and, you know, I get those calls from him every once in a while because, you know, his first love was music. And so, you know, he'd call me up. He'd know I'd always be there. I'd show up whatever time Sue would go. Sue goes, Johnny. Oh, okay, I guess I'm going to the club. <laughs> and that happened for a while. But some great shows there, I mean, over the years still now. But I couldn't believe some of the things you saw there. You know, first time I saw Black Crows jamming there or wow. Jacob Dylan. Yeah, yeah. Or Beck, you know, these, these, these bands that just wanted to play there because it was the happening spot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still the same way it is, yeah. Yeah, cool. Very cool. Um, so you were the on call. Uh, we need a guitar player. We need a bass player. Get over yeah, here. Yeah, he, he, he knew he could depend on me, and I'd be there. So you'd hold your own and and make. Yeah, it. <laughs> and it was always fun, you know. Yeah, and all the people that have always worked there have always been cool, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That crew back there was really cool. Yeah, uh, all of them. And yeah, I remember seeing Michael Hutchins down there one time with Helena Christensen in the downstairs bar. I was like, "Whoa!" Right. Yeah. Well, who, who is the who is the model Johnny was going out with? In the Kate club? Moss. That it was her 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 birthday. That was her birthday. Yeah, it was her birthday, and Hutchinson was there, and that's when I showed up. Wow. And it was like, I think it was after hours even. So wow. We might have shut the club down. Still, just um, wanted to jam after hours. Yeah. The guys wanted to play after hours, so <laughs> very cool. It's a clubhouse, musical clubhouse. Yep. So cool. I also saw you did some stuff with Joe Perry. That came from the Hollywood Vampires, I would imagine. You, yeah. What, what kind of happened first was um, I had met Joe and, and Stephen from Aerosmith. Um, well, I forget where we met him. I think Johnny had ran into. Uh, uh, to, to Steven Tyler at one of the Pirates premieres. Mm -hmm. I forget which one. And Tyler was really nice. And so he invited, uh, Johnny called me and goes, hey man, Aaron Smith wants me to go to the studio. You want to go? I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to go. <laughs> so, so we went down over to the swing house where they were recording. Cool. And it was, Joe was there and, um, and Steven and we just hung out like flies on the wall and just listened and, I met Jack Douglas, who yeah. I love, as a, I've always loved as a producer and a friend of mine now. And we just kind of all hit it off. And the first thing I had did with Joe was he wanted to do a Christmas, like like a Christmas EP, because they were in the middle of something. Mm -hmm. Like Aerosmith was taking a little time off. So I... Uh, I said, sure. So we went in and we did like a five song, four or five song Christmas EP did for charity. And that's how I got to know him. And then he asked me to do his audio book, which was very interesting. And, hmm. um, and I got to know Joe doing that. Like he, um, he wanted to do his own audio book instead of somebody else. That's so cool. I spent like a, it was probably a good 10 days with him just recording him, you know, doing his book and just we became good friends and um then he asked me to do his solo record and i finished most of that with him and then kind of the vampires all started around that ah yeah because joe in the beginning joe wasn't kind of involved on the first vampires record that was already kind of getting done or it was he wasn't he was busy at the time and so he came in on the um I think he played on a couple songs on that first record that that we did, and then um, that's how I wound up doing the stuff with Joe on oh. his record. Oh, got it. Yeah, I yeah. remember Jack Jack Douglas at the 
at Swing House and all that. Everybody was uh, oh, yeah, stoked yeah. about that. Jack's, yeah, Jack's an amazing. I love Jack. I got to know him really well. And he's actually interested in taking help me out with Veronica's band. So wow. cool. to me, it's a great match because, you know, um, obviously he totally gets where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. And two, it's like I can sure use the help. I've kind of done what I can do and they're doing what they can do. But to have somebody with his you know, experience and name and, you know, and love of music will definitely help the girls out, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. No, they, they're a great band, the Glam Skanks, and they, they, you know, they played Viper a couple of few months ago. And you're always yeah. there when they play, supporting. Great band. With the Vampires thing, you know, I didn't think I was going to be in the band on stage because I just was like, First of all, I'm not I'm not famous enough, and I never expected to do it. I just expected to help on the record. Right. And then out of the blue, they're like, "Okay, you're gonna play guitar and, and keyboards, and you're gonna MD." I'm like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna tell these guys what to fucking play: Matt Sorum and Robert DeLeo and you know Joe Perry and I mean what? But." It was a it was an interesting thing, and then they're going, "You're going to play rock and Rio. I'm like, "What?" You know, and there was a part of me, honestly. And then we did the Grammys. There was a part of me that I, and it's an odd thing because I was emotional. I didn't feel like I deserved it. Hmm. Like I was like, I, I I don't I I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not here on because of me. You know. Or, or um, you know, these guys have done this. These guys are in the Hall of Fame. What am I doing here? Mm-hmm. And then I thought back about, you know, my life and all the guys that didn't get as far as I got, you know, that would kill to go up there. And then I found out that Cooper had never played the Grammys. So then I just kind of shut my mouth and went, you better enjoy this. <laughs> and it goes by in a flash. It's like a weird TV show. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. You know, all these people are going to see you, and it literally goes by in three and a half minutes, and it's over. But it was interesting, a lot of I, uh, cause I, a lot of reflecting on my life and what I had been through, and because I, I don't ever regret any decisions I've made, or you know, feel bad that I never got this or that. It's always been this is the path I'm going on. I'm cool with it now. Now, if I can help younger musicians. That's why I started the little label I have and, you know, to just kind of mentor people. And, you know, the business is so different now that I think that in some ways it's better, but you've got to have a hell of a work ethic and mm-hmm. you got to, you got to, it's a 24 seven job. Like you, you know, you know, back in the day, you used to have to impress some guys in the suits to, you know, give you a shot. And then if you got the shot, then if you worked hard enough and they believed in you, even if you had a drug problem, they just prop you right up on stage. Well, now they're just waiting to see what you do on your own, and then you're, then they come scoop you up. Mm-hmm. But I keep telling young people now that I meet, even Veronica's band, like when she started wanting to do this and she told me the name of the band, I said, you know, I fucking love that name of that band, Glamscakes. I said, but you're gonna, that's going to be hard. You know, it's not like you're going to go and get signed by Hollywood Records. She goes, I don't give a fuck. She goes, I just do this because I love it. And mm-hmm. that's when I knew she was doing it for the right reason. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when she first started, they were this cute little band. And, you know, I probably could have walked into any label in town and said, hey, give them some songwriters. And they look great. And But that's not what she wanted. And she'd rather do it like this. And to me, any band that's starting now that's young is that's what you got to do you can't you can't hope you get something to go viral you just got to work it one fan at a time mm-hmm. let them care about who you are get, be true to your art you know whether it's three chords and fun or you're political whatever it is and stay at it and stay involved and keep producing and putting out music because it's easy now it's easier than a number of years ago. You had to find somebody that would record you. Or you'd have to save up thousands of dollars to go in a studio. Now, if you use your brain, you can figure out a way to record something in your house. You know, and yeah. So I think it's so much more wide open for artists 
you still have the big machine out there that's going to, you know, put up their pop acts and things like that. But I think there's still a good, you know, it's, it's always going to be about live music. Yeah. Because you can't digitize that. And that's one thing why I think the skanks are, are who they are is because I told Veronica when she was 13, I said, you better be good live because that's the only thing they're not going to be able to digitize soon. Hmm. And you're going to be, you know, playing live gigs because you're fun to see live. and They can't steal that. And, and you can be able to survive that way. And that's what I believe, you know. Yeah. Very, people, you're just giving, yeah, you're giving your music away now, basically. Excellent advice, though, and I see it. You know, every night there's there's bands are doing it, and they're it's yeah. and they're they're getting by, they're surviving, and it's you know it's just a different playing field, you know, and that's all. Yeah, yeah. it's exactly. You know, it's weird. It's like unfortunately in L.A. it's sort of the hardest because all of us are here. So to me, Europe is huge. I mean, the girls go over to Europe and they're like blown away response of people mm -hmm. just to music because i mean we, in la we've beat, been beaten down by music in a way mm. um but there's still great music coming out of there but my advice to bands go to arizona go to oregon you know find somebody to take you to europe i mean they when they go to tour europe the promoter puts them up feeds them and pays them mm. <laughs> <laughs> all you gotta do i know it's hard you gotta get yourself there and get some and get some uh transportation but once you're there it's just so different than here i wish that america took care of their musicians like the europeans did you know mm. they'll literally put you up in their house if wow. they have a club wow you know and it just takes that persistence to keep playing and playing until it just people want you know they follow you they want to get what you put out and they believe what you're doing that's you know that's the new i think the new answer to to being successful in the music business on your own, you know. Mm -hmm. The new path. Yeah, yeah like Good that's advice. what I was doing. If you, if you and me were 20 now and we're in a band, I'm like, all right, dude, where are we going tonight? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Beat the streets. Go play. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, seriously, yeah. Every night. Play every night. Yeah. Very good advice. Well, yeah. thank thank you so much for. Uh, oh no problem, man. My this. pleasure. I hope it helps you out. I appreciate it, and we'll 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 see you the next time you're at the club, hanging out, or, or seeing your daughter play with Glam Skanks. You got it, brother. All right. No, take no it. problem. We'll talk soon. All right. Good talk to you, Thanks, Bruce. Tommy. Bye. Bye. Don't forget to subscribe to Five or More Questions with Tommy Black on your favorite podcast app. And visit ViperRoom.com for upcoming shows. Wow, these new Music One headphones sound really great. <laughs> <laughs>